in this uh, website now. It's uh, Ancient History Encyclopedia regarding Phoenicia and the Phoenicians, because we're going to get a lot of reference of them. We know we just heard that the Phoenicians, uh, you know, Canaanites, uh, Hittites, Hamites, you know, they were driven out. They lived in the land of Canaan. They're going to get a lot of that reference. All right, so Phoenicia, right? Uh, now, we got to dodge the hijack when we read this because, of course, they're still putting Phoenicians and, and the, the cities of, of the Phoenicians in the other side of the world, the Mediterranean, Middle East, and all that. So we got to dodge the hijack. But just for reference, let's read this. It says, Phoenicia was an ancient civilization composed of independent city-states located along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, stretching through the, what is now Syria, Lebanon, and northern Israel. All right, so first... The Aztecs, the Mayas, the Incas, a lot of the people here lived in city-states as well. All right, so remember, Phoenicians lived in city-states. City-states, just like the Aztecs, just like the Maya, just like a lot of the Olmec, just like a lot of the uh, nations that were here in America lived in city-states. All right, and remember that the land of Shem, Lebanon was in the land of Shem. Lebanon was in the land of Shem. And Canaan wanted to settle in Lebanon, which was Shem's land. Remember that. This was America, not on the Mediterranean. They clumped all these cities and towns together right next to each other in that little spot of the world over there in the desert. Come on, man. You got to break the spell. These people were separated by large distances. America's big. All right. So let's continue saying the Phoenicians were a great marine time people known for their mighty ships adorned with horses heads in honor of their god of the sea jam the brother of Mott, the god of death, the island city of Tyre and the city of Sidon were the most powerful states in Phoenicia, with Kebal, Biblos, and Baalbek as the most important spiritual religious centers. All right. So it says Phoenician city-states began to take form 3200 BC. All right, touch the hijack with the chronology. And were established by 2750 BC. Phoenicia tried as a maritime trader and manufacturer center for 1500 to 300 BC and highly regarded for their skill in shipbuilding, glass making, the production of dyes, and impressive level of skill in the manufacture of luxury and common goods. Yes, they were bringing all this knowledge from the Amarokas. All right. Now it says that um, in scriptures, uh, in Herodotus cites Phoenicia as the birthplace of alphabet. All right, because the Phoenicians, what do they speak? There's if you look at the Phoenician writing, it's basically Paleo-Hebrew. Paleo-Hebrew, which they spoke here in America. Paleo-Picto. Even before the Paleo, there's a Picto, right? We got the uh, Los Luna Stones in New Mexico with Paleo-Hebrew, or they call Phoenician. They try to give Phoenician, like saying Phoenicians came over here, but Phoenicians were over here. All right? So many Phoenician uh, evidence over here in America, right? It's because they were from over here. And they talking about alphabet, right? Talking about a mother tongue, a mother tongue that they introduced because they were the ones being driven out of here and going to the rest of the world. They were bringing that. They said they brought it to the Greece by the Phoenician Cadmus alphabet sometime before the 8th century BC. And that prior to that, the Greeks had no alphabet. The Phoenician alphabet is the basis for most Western languages written today in their city of Gibal, called by the Greek Biblos, gave the Bible its name from the Greek ta Biblia, the books. All right, so Biblia or Bible means a collection of books or Biblos. All right, it's a Phoenician or ancient Paleo-Hebrew word. All right, that was given to the Greeks. All right, and it was, Gebal was a great exporter of papyrus, it says Gebal. Bublos to the Greeks, which was the paper used in writing in ancient Egypt and Greece. It is also no thought that many of the gods of ancient Greece were imported from Phoenicia. And there are certain undisputable similarities in some stories concerning the Phoenician gods Baal, Yam, and the Greek deities of Zeus and Poseidon. All right. So these gods that the Greeks eventually got, the Romans and all the, even the Egyptians, right? Because it, even it'll it'll say Phoenicians right starts in Phoenicia but these are the same gods they got from Egypt all right the Phoenician gods are Atlantis the ten Atlantis kings the Atlantean kings which eventually became Greek gods like Zeus all right so they're trying to let you know that this is you know the Phoenician gods were basically Atlantean gods we're gonna get into that Atlantis was over here all right, part of connected to the Amarukas, 
All right. It is also notable that the battle between the Christian God and Satan as related in the biblical book of Revelation seems as much later version of the same conflict with many of the same details of one finds in the Phoenician myth of Baal and Jan. You see, these are duplicate stories being repeated over and over. All right, there's some history to the Bible is what I'm trying to show you. All right, even those written allegorically. All right, it's some truth in it. We got to dodge the hijack. All right, because you see it's similar. This Phoenician tales similar to the, the book of Revelation, right? Now, this is an important part. It says, in its time, Phoenicia, right, was known as Canaan. Oh, all right, Canaan. Remember, we just went over all this, right? What was Canaan? The land of Canaan, or it was called the land of Canaan, known as the land, because Canaan went and settled in Shem's lot, right? He liked Lebanon. He's like, I like Lebanon. I like that part of the world right there. I ain't going to that hot-ass place in Africa or, or, or Ham's land. Right, and then he said, uh, "I'm gonna settle there. That looks nice. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's perfect. I like it." Right, so Canaan settled in Shem's lot. So again, they're telling you that Phoenicia is Canaan. It's the same thing. Phoenicia was over here in the Promised Land. All right, and they settled there without permission. All right, and it is the land ref reference in the Hebrew Scriptures to which Moses led the Israelites from Egypt, in which Joshua, Jehoashi gets a cult then conquered according to the biblical books of Exodus and Joshua but uncorroborated by other ancient texts and unsupported by the physical evidence thus far excavated all right what are they telling you here they're digging up things over there and they can't find any evidence they're looking in the wrong place of course they ain't gonna find anything and of course they're gonna say that it's not unsupported they don't want you to know what happened but then we got a lot of uh, things describing Joshua driving out a certain people out Phoenicians, Canaanites and all that we have uh, historic uh, tablets uh, steels that record this the Mesha stone, the Moabite stone Mesha steel is one of them we're going to read into another one right after this, alright but yes, it's, it is supported and of course they're not going to find evidence in the wrong place have they looked over here? are they excavating over here? According to the historian Richard Miles, the people of the land recognized a shared ethnic identity as Kanai. So the people that these Phoenicians were actually, they recognized themselves as Kanai, Kanaini, inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Remember, this is in Shem's land. Yet despite a common linguistic, cultural, and religious inheritance, they're not one people, a bunch of different people, city states. It's not just one big Phoenician nation or Phoenician people. All right, they just grouping a bunch of people together, calling them Phoenicians. The region was very rarely politically united, with each city operating as a sovereign state ruled over by a king, city-states, just like in the Americas. The city-states of Phoenicia flourished through marine time trade between 1500 BC and 300 BC, when the major cities were conquered by Alexander the Great. Yep, he was here. This person known as Alexander the Great, whatever his real name was, was here conquering and doing battles and all that over here i think we got a little bit of that in the uh the investigation that's going on in illinois and the burroughs cave and a lot of artifacts that show alexander the great uh evidence of him might you know being here so this corroborates with that because america was over here artifacts i mean phoenicia the lands of the phoenicians were over here it says artifacts from the region have been found as far away as britain we're going to get into that the phoenicians in britain as close as egypt and then it's clear the Phoenician luxury goods were highly prized by cultures for whom they traded. All right. So Phoenicia, just to get um, the hijacks for you, right? It's ancient history encyclopedia. There is some truth in here, though. All right. We got to pull out the babies. Now we're going to go to another book, one of my favorite books. All right. So we are in this book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World by Ignatius Donnelly. All right, I've read this book a lot of times in different videos. There's still so much info in here that I, we haven't even gone over. This was written in 1882. All right, University of Toronto, Library of Congress. All right, his sources are so legit. You can verify yourself. This is the uh, contents of this book. All right, just so you can see, we're going to get into the uh, gods of the Phoenicians, also kings of Atlantis. All right, right here. But I just wanted to show you the Central American and Mexican colonies. All right. Atlantis is over here. All right. So let's go to the page that we're going to get into. Now, just a reminder, this author, 
he's been definitely putting a lot of sources and a lot of work into com you know showing you with facts that there was some kind of a uh, island called Atlantics on the western side of, of, of Europe and Africa you know we know it was just talking about America even if a, a small even if a part sank it was attached to us it was part of this part of the world this side of the world it, it made commerce and traded with the other colonies on this side in Central America South America North America all right so it was part of this kingdom over here whatever happened whatever was done in this so-called part uh, called Atlantis right with the technology and something the people doing something they weren't supposed to right now that's a different story who was these Atlantis right but um, either way, they were over here, right? So he, he shows you a lot of that, um, but he doesn't try to connect it with the mainland. He just tries to say these are colonies from the island that went down, but it's all the same. All right, now it says the gods of the Phoenicians, also kings of Atlantis. All right, we're just talking about the Americas, man. So why would they have, why would these Phoenicians have Atlantean gods, right? If they're from the Mediterranean, all the way over there has nothing to do with them, right? So not now it says not alone were the gods of the Greeks, because they just came from talking about the gods, the Greek gods being Atlanteans, right? He broke it down, all right, in the previous chapter. So not alone were the gods of the Greeks the deified kings of Atlantis, but we find that the mythology of the Phoenicians was drawn from the same source. They just getting it from here. All these nations, especially the Greeks. All right, when they're talking about Atlantis and the Western Ethiopians and all that, they're just talking about you over here. All right, when Her um, Herodotus is talking about that the ancestors of the Egyptians, they come from a distant Western land where the original people came from. They're just talking about you, all right? This is things you can look up. For instance, we find it in the Phoenician cosmogony that the Titans the titans or giants, Rephaim, we get this in the Bible, Rephaim derived their origin from the Phoenician gods, Agrus and Agrotus. This connects the Phoenicians with that island in the remote west, the remote west, far away in the west, in the midst of an ocean, where according to the Greeks, the titans dwell, the, the, the giants. Now, we know in the biblical story, Jehoshua, uh, Moses sent Jehoshua, Joshua, to spy on the land of Canaan, and what did he find? He found giants. He found giants. All right. Phoenicians are giants. All right. Who was in the land of Canaan? Giants, Phoenicians, Canaanites. All right. And so the Incas, as well, the Mayas, the Olmec, say when they reached their land, there was giants there that they had to fight, that they had to remove. All right. The Olmec talk about this. The Incas, the Mayas, all right? They talk about giants being in their land, all right? This corroborates and having to remove them, okay? According to Sanconiaton, Uranus was the son of Octocton. And according to Plato, Octocton was one of the 10 kings of Atlantis. Talking about an Octocton, original man. He was in where? America, Atlantis slash Atlantis he married his sister G he is the Uranus of the Greeks Uranus he is the Uranus the same Uranus Uranus same who was the son of Gaia the earth whom he married the Phoenicians tell us Uranus had by G four sons Ilus was L who is called Kronos all right and Betilus Beth L L hmm. L who uses L in their last name and Dagon, Dagon, the Dogon, the Dagon. Haven't I told you this man something to do with corn? Didn't I tell you this man corn, which signifies bread corn or corn bread? Bread corn. Is corn not a native plant to America? Huh? Who are these mysterious Dogon? Where do they come from? Were these Phoenicians that got kicked out of Canaan? All right, what does their name resemble corn so much? Dagon and which was a king a god of uh, fertility right agriculture and all that corn and Atlas Tammuz Atlas Tammuz are we talking about Thoth the famous Thoth our friend Thoth talking about the hijack here the king of hijacks here 
Again, we have the name of two other kings of Atlantis. These four sons probably represented four races, the offspring of the earth, probably. The Greek Uranus was the father of Kronos and the ancestor of Atlas. The Venetian god Uranus had a great many other wives. His wife G was jealous. They quarreled and he attempted to kill the children he had by her. This is the legend which the Greeks told of Zeus and Juno. Same story passed down to other gods. In the Phoenician mythology, Kronos raised a rebellion against Uranus and after a great battle dethroned him. In the Greek legend, it is Zeus who attacks and overthrows his father Kronos. Uranus had a daughter called Astarte, Ashtoreth, Easter, another called Rhea, and Dagon, after he had found out bread corn and the plow was called Zeus Arostrios. Jesus Christos, Jesus Arostrios. Uh, you see, see what we're getting into? Zeus, just add a J E here. It's Jesus. All right, not Joshua. We find also in the Phoenician legends mention made of Poseidon, founder and king of Atlantis. Poseidon, king of Atlantis, or uh, yeah, the island in America. Cronus gave Attica to his daughter Athena. As in the Greek legends, in a time of plague, he sacrificed his son to Uranus and circumcised, circumcised himself and compelled his allies to do the same thing. It would thus appear that this singular rite practiced as we have seen by the Atlantides, so the Atlanteans did that, right, Americans of the old and new worlds. The Egyptians did it. They were over here too. The Phoenicians did it. They were over here too. The Hebrews were over here. The Ethiopians, what do you mean, Ethiopians? People of dark skin? The Mexicans, the Mexicans, what are you talking about? The Mexica people and the Red Men of America. So these are different. The Mexicans and the Red Men of America are different. You see how they're separating that? Well, all these people were circumcised. Hmm. And they all had something to do with America. Right? Isn't that a coincidence? As we might have expected to Atlantis. Cronus visits the different regions of the habitable world. He gave Egypt as a kingdom to the god Tot, Tot, Tot. Go over there. So when we read the emerald tablets of Thoth, right, or the uh, the emerald green tablets of Atlantis, right, written by Thoth, he tells you straight up he was in Atlantis. There was some kind of cataclysm, volcanic. He he describes like a volcanic cataclysm. All right. Even in the uh, Egyptian uh, Book of the Dead, they write that Thoth came from a city state, a city and a lake. In the lake, it was driven by fire. It got dark and fire. Right, like a volcanic eruption. He lived in a city in a lake. Wasn't Tenochtitlan? Isn't it in a lake? Wasn't it built in a lake? And it oversaw two volcanoes, two mythical volcanoes. All right, so look into that, Mike. Do a video about that. But hey, Todd, we already know. We broke it down. Todd's from over here. Where's the greeny beast from? Look at the green EBs, right? Thoughts is the EBs, the green EBs, Central America, America, the green EBs. All right. So again, he gave Egypt as a kingdom to the god Thot, who had invented the alphabet. He invented the alphabet. I thought it was the Phoenicians. Remember, we just got on the other website. It was the Phoenicians. So Thot is a Phoenician. Thot spoke Paleo Hebrew. Thot spoke Paleo Hebrew. Ancient, ancient. Ancient picto, pictograph. The Egyptians called him Thoth, and he was represented among them as the god of letters, the clerk of the underworld, bearing a tablet, pen, palm branch. Underworld, like Anubis. That's why we got Hermanubis, because we know Thoth is Hermes. Hermes, Hermanubis is Thoth. It's all the same, it's just different epithets of Thoth. All right, bearing a tablet, pen, and a palm branch. This not only connects the Phoenicians with Atlantis, but shows the relations of Egyptian civilization to both Atlantis and the Phoenicians. It's all connected. You see, this is all right here. We're talking about the true old world. Atlantis slash Amaruka. There can be no doubt that the royal personages who formed the gods of Greece were also the gods of the Phoenicians. Same. We have seen the autochton of Plato reappearing in the autochton of the Phoenicians. 
the Atlas of Plato in the Atlas of the Phoenicians, the Poseidon of Plato in the Poseidon of the Phoenicians, while the kings of Mestor and Menesus of Plato are probably the gods Misor and Aminus of the Phoenicians. Sanctonian tells us, after narrating all the discoveries by which the people advanced to civilization, that the Kabiri set down their records of the past by the command of the god Thoth, and they delivered them to their successors and to foreigners, of whom one was Osiris, Os Osiris, the inventor of the three-letter, the brother of Chua, who is called the first Phoenician. Uh, and this is in Lournemont and Cavalier, Ancient History of the East, Volume 2, page 228. All right, so remember that T A A U T Tot is the Phoenician Tot, same person. This is how they wrote it. Same. All right. This will show that the first Phoenician came long after this line of the kings or gods, and that he was a foreigner. All right. Remember now, he was a foreigner. The first Phoenician god or king, he was a foreigner as compared with them, and therefore that it could not have been the Phoenicians proper who made the several inventions narrated by St. Coniathon, but some other race whom, for whom the Phoenicians might have been descended. All right, descended. They were descended. And in the delivery of their records of the foreigner Osiris, the god of Egypt, we have another evidence that Egypt derived her civilization from Atlantis. Egypt from Atlantis. Egypt to Mary was in Atlantis. The Semitic languages also are all var varieties of one form of speech. Though we do not know that primitive language from which the Semitic dialects diverge, they don't know, so how can they say where it comes from? They don't know. They just know it's all similar. They know that they're all similar and related. Yet we know that at one time such language must have, must have existed, that one mother tongue. All right, we're talking about in Atlantis, in America. We cannot derive Hebrew from Sanchrist or Sanchrist from Hebrew. All right, they're not telling you that it, Hebrew came out of Sanchrist because they try to say Sanchrist is the oldest. Or oh, that Sanchrist from Hebrew or that Sanchrist came out of Hebrew, but there seems some, some similarity there. There has to be a common uh, language somewhere there that was in Atlantis. But we can well understand how both may have proceeded from one common source. They are both channels supplied from one river, and they carry, though not always on the surface, floating materials of language which ca challenge comparison and have already yielded satisfactory results to careful analysis. Outlines of Philosophy of History, Volume 1. All right, this is studies people have done. They know that Sanchrist and Hebrew are the same. Didn't I tell you the Nagas? Who's the ancient Nagas? Who founded the whole Naga thing, the whole teachings? It was Prince Maya. Do you remember my Naga video? Untold Ancient American Truth, I believe part six or seven. All right. It was Prince Maya who brought all this knowledge and civilization to Hindustan, India, the, the other India, Hindustan. All right. And we see Sankras in Hebrew are similar. We're talking about Paleo Hebrew, Paleo, ancient pictograph Hebrew right they call it Hebrew but you know just the way we're referencing there was an ancient tradition among the Persians that the Phoenicians migrated from the shores of the Eratian Sea and this has been supposed to mean the Persian Gulf all right so it was supposed it's not though so remember the Phoenicians migrated from somewhere else all right but there was a very old city Erythia in the utter ruin in the time of Strabo, which was built in some ancient age, long before the founding of Gades, near that site of that town on the Atlantic coast of Spain. May not this town of Erythia have given its name to the adjacency? And this may have been the starting point of the Phoenicians in their European migration. So they're saying instead of that being the location where they began, is that the location they got to first in Spain and then did their European migrations from there. It would even appear that there was an island of Erythia. In the Greek mythology of the tenth labor of Hercules consisted in driving away the cattle of Gerion, who lived in the island of Erythia, an island somewhere in the remote west, in the remote west, beyond the pillars of Hercules, in the Atlantic Ocean. That's where Erythia was. Talking about America, the Phoenicians, the real Erythia. The real Erythia 
was a remote island in the west beyond the pillars of Hercules, okay? This is from Murray's Mythology, page 257. Hercules stole the cattle from this remote oceanic island and returning drove them through Iberia, Gaul, over the Alps and through Italy. It is probable that a people emigrating from the Erythian Sea, that is from the Atlantic first, gave their name to a town on the coast of Spain and at a later date to the Persian Gulf, as we have seen the name of York carried from England to the banks of Hudson and then to the Arctic Circle. So they're saying they carried that name with them to Europe and Spain and all these places and named it that from here. The builders of the Central American cities are reported to have been a bearded race. The Phoenicians, in common with the Indians, practice human sacrifices to a great extent. Hmm. So who are these Indians that were doing it too? You know, we got to stop grouping these people together. We know when they talk about Phoenicians, they're grouping already people together like Canaanites, Hamites, Moabites, a lot of these Jebusites. All right, we're going to read that. All right. So they're grouping a lot of people together. And we know that a lot of these people, even in the Bible, say that they did sacrifice, right? They were doing things, you know, that they weren't, they shouldn't have been doing. All right. So it says the Phoenicians in common with the Indians practice human sacrifice to a great extent. So when you hear stories of, uh, these nations over here in America doing human sacrifice. So which nations were they? Are we talking about the so-called Phoenicians that were here that settled in our in, in the lands of Shem? That settled in the lands of Shem and in, in the land that was not given to them. And, and then Joshua had to drive them out because they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff like human sacrifices. All right, so was it all the nations that were doing human sacrifices here? Or just a group of people that were holding it down for a period of time in a specific location? But then you're forgetting about the whole history in that place where all the nations that lived in the same place practicing human sacrifice. Or was it just um, a time period of certain specific people who were ruling at that time? Get what I'm saying? Now, it says they worship fire. And water adopted the names of the animals whose skins they wore. Skins they wore, they wore skins. That is to say, they had the totemic system telegraphed by means of fires, poisoned their arrows, offered peace before beginning battle, and used drums. Bancroft's native races. All right, so check this out. So, Bancroft, we have that book. Real good historian, a lot of good sources in his book. All right, he even reference that the Phoenicians had a lot of similarities to some of the Indian nations here. The extent of country covered by the commerce of the Phoenicians represents to some degree the area of the old Atlantean Empire. Their colonies and trading posts extended east and west from the shores of the Black Sea through the Mediterranean to the west coast of Africa and of Spain and around to Ireland and England, but from north to south they ranged from the Baltic to the Persian Gulf. They touched every point where civilization in later ages made its appearance. Strabo estimated that they had 300 cities along the west coast of Africa. When Columbus sailed to discover a new world or rediscover an old one, he took his departure from a Phoenician seaport founded by the great race 2,500 years previously. The Phoenicians had already been in the Iberian Peninsula right they had previously been driven out remember they have been driven out of canaan so they had went over to that side remember they asked for permission to settle northwest africa over there and they also settled in the iberian peninsula a lot of the uh, british isles they settled in all those areas these so-called phoenicians all right this atlantean sailor with his phoenician features sailing from an atlantean port simply reopened the path of commerce and colonization which had been closed when plato's island sunk in the sea you see so he's there saying columbus was an atlantean descendant of a phoenician talking about moabite moabite canaanite talking about more what are we talking about here we're talking about atlantean and it is a curious fact that columbus had the antediluvian world in his mind even then for when he reached the mouth of the Orinoco. He thought it was the river Gihon that flowed out of paradise and he rode home to Spain. There are here great indications suggesting the proximity of the earthly paradise for not only does it correspond in mathematical position 
with the opinions of the holy and learned theologians, but all other signs concur to make it probable. Columbus letting you know when he reached the Orinoco, he had reached close to Garden of Eden. It had to be, he said. It had to be. Sanconiaton claims that the learning of Egypt, Greece, and Judea was derived from the Phoenicians. It would appear probable that while other races represent the conquest of or colonizations of Atlantis, the Phoenicians succeeded to their arts, sciences, and especially their commercial supremacy, and hence the close resemblances which we have found to exist between the Hebrews, a branch of the Phoenician stock, and the people of America. All right, so they're mixing all this together, but it's because you got to understand, you got to understand what's going on. So if Phoenicians are Canaanites or Hamites, we know those are the, Ham is the son of Noah. All right, so they might have some Hebrew connection there, right? Uh, if you're talking about Moab, Moab were Hebrews, right? All right, so we're done with this chapter. Just wanted to get a little reference of that for you. All right, so I'm in this journal here. It's called the Journal for the Study of the Pseudopigrapha, or I guess pseudo uh, um, apocrypha books, right? They, they will consider. So this is called uh, Procopius of Casarea in the Girashite Diaspora. This is from the History Department in the University of Haifa in Israel, All right? says Procopius of Caesarea reports the existence of an inscription in Numidia all right so this famous historian this Greek I believe historian or Roman historian all right he has a lot of books called history of the wars he writes about almost every ancient war very famous it's, it's cited a lot as a primary source all right even though they try to say he made up some things he might have made up some things but we're talking about a primary source from that time all right now Procopius reports the existence of an inscription in Numidia. All right, what does this inscription say? Allegedly written by the refugees from Canaan's conquest by Joshua. All right, hmm. allegedly written refugees. Well, if you go to a land that's not yours and you settle there and then you own it and then you know you do whatever you want with it and don't give it to the people you belong to, and then you get kicked out. I guess you yeah, you are a refugee from Canaan because of Joshua, Jehoshua, Jahawashi. While this claim cannot be taken at face value, it raises interesting questions as to its provenance and purpose. All right, so remember they said there was no accounts of any other thing other than the Bible. So we got one inscription here in the media stating this, right? All right, according to Procopius. All right. All right, so before I continue with Procopius, because I just want to make sure we understand what we're reading when we're reading things from people, certain specific people. This is not Wikipedia, right? So the Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that Procopius is a Byzantine historian, all right? Procopius, born probably between 490 and 507 in Caesarea, Palestine, now Israel, died in 565. Byzantine historian whose works are an indispensable source for his period and contain much geographical information so when they are reading this when we're reading this other article saying allegedly he found so now we don't believe him but sometimes we do he's an indispensable source only when it fits our narrative right only when it fits our narrative then we'll say he's an indispensable source but when he's talking about and connecting you know that josh was kicking out certain people from canaan right no, that's allegedly that they found a, a, a stone, a legend, right? Refugees from Canaan, right? But Britannica Encyclopedia right here is telling you straight up. It's an indispensable source. Look up who Procopius is. All right, I just wanted you to know, all right? Just wanted you to see, okay? Let's go back. So... Procopius, again, reports the existence of inscription in the media, allegedly written by the refugees of Canaan's conquest by Joshua. While this claim cannot be taken at face value, it raises interesting questions as to its provenance and purpose. Regarding provenance, the complicated situation of the sources, especially the ongoing debate about the real date of Moses of Corini, unfortunately prevents a firm conclusion. So you see, because the chronology is all messed up and they did that on purpose, things don't connect. So only because of that, but if not, they would believe it if it did connect with the, the chronology. 
All right. Well, they purposely made through Moses and, and, and David and everybody BC times Joshua. They purposely did that. All right. Unfortunately, for, okay. So regarding purpose, the inscription seems to reflect the political and religious tensions, political and religious tensions, which accompanied Belisarius campaign to regain North Africa for the Roman Empire and Justinian's attempt to Christianize those parts of African society who abided by their polytheistic and ancestral custom. Continuing in the article, now it says, in the fourth book of his wars, the historian Procopius of Caesarea tells a tantalizing story about a strange inscription by way of introduction to his description of the war waged by the Romans against the Moors. Oh, you see? See how we found the Moors? All right. An unhappy affair which followed Belisarius' successful North African campaign. So are we talking about when we say Romans? Are we talking about Edomites against Moabites, Canaanites? All right. Procopius gives us an excursus on Moorish antiquities. All right. He gives us an, an excursus all right, of Moorish antiquities. At his heart stands the report of an inscription in Phoenician letters. There we go. What I tell you, Phoenician, they just mean Paleo-Hebrew. They found an inscription in Paleo-Hebrew in which the Moors allegedly identify themselves as the descendants of those refugees who have fled Canaan. Oh, this is correlating. Are you saying Procopius is correlating with what Noble Drew Ali is saying? Is that what you're saying? Yes, that is what you're saying. All right. Again, it alleges that the Moors identify themselves as the descendants of those refugees who had fled Canaan following the onslaught of Joshua and the Israelites. Oh, so now Joshua and the Israelites are evil. You see what they're doing, right? So you see that there's a there's there's two sides of the story is what I'm trying to show you, right? I know we just get the biblical account of Joshua and just taking out the Canaanites and Jebusites and stuff. There was a reason for that, right? We know that this land was promised to Shem's descendants, not Canaan's descendants who had settled there without permission, right? So that's why there was an onslaught by Joshua and the Israelites. So this inscription that Procopius is telling us existed. Is telling us that they themselves identified themselves as those people who got driven out and kicked out of the land of Canaan, the promised land in America. All right, in America. All right, because Phoenicia was the land of Canaan. All right, Moors allegedly identified themselves as the descendants of those refugees who have fled Canaan following the onslaught of Joshua and Israelites. Procopius thus presents the modern historian with a highly complicated dilemma. You see, now it's a problem because now he's telling us real history and we're like, whoa, wait, but hold, hold up, but Procopius, but I don't, we're so confused. But they just said he's an indispensable source. Let's go back. Procopius, historian whose works are an indispensable source for his period and contain much geographical information encyclopedia britannica all right so now it's a complicated dilemma of source criticism how is one to interpret a sixth century ce report of a now lost inscription is it lost or did they destroy it or hide in it describing events which purportedly took place in the late second millennium bc well because chronology is messed up they lied about chronology it's not in that time period my purpose in this article is twofold first i propose to investigate the provenance of this inscription did it actually exist did some locals offer an inventive translation for an obscure inscription procopius had seen did procopius read about the joshua story in some book or did he make the whole thing up second i propose to examine the inscription with within the context in which it is reported and to ask why Procopius shows to include it in his work. All right. So they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure it out. Why did this indispensable source, this primary source, this historian, which gets cited a lot in history when they're talking about wars. Why? Why did he create this dilemma? They're so confused, right? All right. So I wanted to read to you what Procopius said. All right. The part he's talking about. So I went straight to the book. All right. Now it's called the Wars of Justinian. So again, Procopius has a whole series of books. It's called the History of Wars. 
book one, book two, book three, volume one, you know, so many volumes of the different. So this one in particular, this book, I believe is book three, I believe, or book five, I'm not exactly sure, is The Wars of Justinian. This is the Justinian part, all right? And this is translated by H.B. Dewan, all right? This is the most modern uh, historical source translated. All right, revised and modernized with an introduction notes by Anthony Cadellis. All right, the Wars of Justinian. All right, so look it up. These are in the archives too. The works is H.B. Doing all the volumes, except of course the one I was looking for, which I had to find separately. This is the one I, I found. All right, so I want to go to page uh, 211. All right, so I start again right here. Let me just zoom in a little bit. There we go. Okay, so I'll start right here where it says, as, as the narration of events has now brought me to this point, it is necessary to go back and explain from where the nations of the Moors came to Libya. Where did these nations of the Moors came to Libya? How did they get to Libya? I thought they were always there. I thought they were always there. So they came to Libya and how they settled there. All right. When the Hebrews, now this is Procopius, this is his own words. When the Hebrews had left Egypt and had come near the boundaries of Palestine, Moses, a wise man who led them on the journey, died. And the leadership passed to who? To Joshua, Jehoshua, Deuteronomy 34, right? The, the death of Moses. The power went to Jehoshua, Jehoashi. He led the Israelites into Jerusalem with the sword, not on a donkey, right? Saying, peace, everybody. He took over, assigned by Moses and Hawa, right? He took over the son of Nun. The son of Nun, is Nun a person? Nun is the letter N in Paleo Hebrew. Nun means air, sun, continuity. Air, the sun, air, the air, Joshua, the air, who led this people into Palestine, who led his people into Palestine, Dash the hijack, talking about the true old world by displaying a valor in war greater than its natural for a man all right he displayed so much valor in war that it was like 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 impossible it was like a miracle like he was being helped and he was he was being held by hawa the most high regain his land for his people all right by displaying valor in war greater than its natural for a man he gained possession of the land after overthrowing all the nations he easily won the cities and seemed to be altogether invincible. He was invincible. They couldn't mess with Jahawashi. It's a cult. The priest king. They couldn't mess with. He was invincible. Now at that time. The whole country along the sea from Sidon. As far as the boundaries of Egypt. Was called Phoenicia. I'm talking about America. Alright. It was called Phoenicia. It was also called the land of Canaan. Same place. Right. In ancient times, one king ruled over it, as is agreed by all who have written the earliest accounts of the Phoenicians. In that country, there lived the very populous tribes, the Gergersites, the Jebusites, and some with other names by which they are called in the history of the Hebrews. All right. So you see these Phoenicians that keep getting, they're just a group of people. Two of those tribes are the Jergersites and Jebusites. We know that Joshua right when he got to canaan or, or jerusalem the original Jerusalem, right promised land there was jebusites there canaanite jebusites there that he had to dri drive out giant jebusites all right so they're telling you straight up they're telling you straight up straight up these are moors they're telling you straight up. Procopius is telling you straight up here. These were Moors. These were their land. This is who Joshua drove out. Some of the tribes. When this people then saw that the invading general was irresistible, they couldn't mess with Joshua. They emigrated from their ancestral homes and moved to Egypt. They moved to Egypt. Hmm, are we talking about Tamari? Are we just talking about just another part of America? Tamari, which adjoined their country, which was next to their country. Yes, they were. Yes, they were talking about to marry, to marry, finding there no place sufficient for them to live in, given that there has been a great population in Egypt from ancient times, since there was no room there next to them, so many nations already there, right, in America, they proceeded to Libya, 
they established numerous cities and took possession of the whole of Libya as far as the pillars of Heracles. And they have lived there even up to my time using the Phoenician tongue. Straight up letting you know that these so-called Moors, right? He's saying the Moors, the nations of the Moors that were in Libya in his time, 500 AD or BC, whatever. All right. These are all Phoenicians that got driven out by Joshua. All right. Another source, right? Telling you straight up. These were Phoenicians and they even spoke the Phoenician tongue or Paleo-Hebrew. We are they who fled from before the face of Joshua, the robber the son of Nun, the robber. So now Joshua became the robber. But who robbed the land first? Canaan, son of Ham. Who robbed the land first? Canaan, son of Ham. So now you're calling Jahawashi the robber, right? There were also other nations settled in Libya before the Moors, who on account of having been established there from ancient times were called autochthonous. Because this, they said that Antaios, their king, who wrestled with Heracles and Clipea, was the son of the earth. So there was already people there when the, the so-called Phoenicians got there, right? The part of North Africa. In later times, those who left from Phoenicia or America with Dido came to the inhabitants of Libya as to kingsmen. And the later willingly al allowed them to found and hold Carthage. But as time went on, Carthage became a powerful and populous city. A battle took place between them and their neighbors, who, as was said, had come from Palestine before them and are called Moors today. And the Carthaginians defeated them and forced them to live far from Carthage. Later on, the Romans prevailed over all of them in war and settled the Moors at the edges of the inhabited land of Libya, making the Carthaginians and other Libyans subject and tributary to themselves. Later on, the Moors won many victories over the Vandals and gained possession of the land now called Mauritania, which extends from Cadiz to the boundaries of Caesarea, as well as most of the rest of Libya. Such then is the story of the settlement of the Moors in Libya. All right, so that was the uh, Procopius, you know, history on the Moors in that area, right? 